Okay, so we're going to begin with a little, a little meditation. Uh, rather than saying a lot of prayers at the beginning, um, if you would like to sit with your spine straight, that's the main thing, and eyes not completely open, nor completely shut, uh, just begin to watch your respiration. Just be aware of it without controlling it. If you haven't done this before, it can be quite difficult. It almost seems like you have to control it once you start paying attention to it. Watch your breathing to the exclusion of everything else, if you can. Try to recognize when you're breathing in as opposed to breathing out. And if there are other thoughts going through your mind, try to let go of paying attention to them, giving them any of your energy. We all have the unfortunate uh, ability to multitask. And sometimes when we're trying to watch one thing with our mind, Another part of our mind will be planning the day's schedule or what you're having to do over the weekend, what's happened in the past. Let go of those thought processes and just invest that energy in watching the breathing. Remind yourself to relax your body. Consciously let go of your body, but keep your mind alert. As you breathe in, consciously imagine that you're following the breath up your nostrils to the crown of your head, although the air is going right into your lungs. Imagine it going up to the crown of your head, to your throat, to your middle of your chest, to what Buddhism calls your heart chakra. Not the beating heart, but the middle of the chest, about the level of the heart. Just leave your attention there and watch your mind with your mind. One part of the mental consciousness 
watching the rest, like a little spy in the corner. Maybe you could call it introspection. Looking inward rather than outward. things that you'll see, or you'll be aware of, might be more interesting than uh, what you see outside on the street or on TV. There are different images arising. That might be kind of visual in nature. There might be as those sounds, talking to yourself, inner conversations. Some things that come up will be related with the past. Some future-oriented thoughts, plans, and expectations. Some observations about the present. There may be a very strong sense of you as the observer. You might be thinking, what is, this, what, what is this all about? What am I doing? My back hurts. <clears throat> See if you notice any of many varieties of mental, emotional states. Worry, doubt, sort of in the negative sense, anxiety, maybe positive ones. You know, positive expectations or might be some attachment in your mind, desire for something antipathy or anger, a whole, whole categories of different states that can arise through our mental consciousness as objects, as emotional states and so forth. Here what I'd like you to do is, <coughs> having observed those, don't give them your attention, but rather try to see between the thoughts to some calm spaciousness of the mind that's always there. Or in the case of an emotional state that seems to pervade the whole mind, recognize that that state is arising within a spaciousness of the mind that allows the content to be there. Try to infer, get an intuition of this substratum of the mind that we're going to be calling the clear light nature of the mind. And focus on that rather than the content. If you get a glimpse of it, of some quiet or clarity, try to hold that. You may lose it very quickly and then have to use some analysis to find it again, some thinking.
the nature of the mind, the conventional nature of the mind, is like a, in a sense, like a space, like the sky, that the nature of which is clear, like the sky, sometimes temporarily filled with clouds or, let's say, birds, pollution. But the presence of those temporary objects or states, the presence of them is something that's transitory. They can, just in the ordinary cycle of things, change. Even on a cloudy day, we can understand the nature of the, of the sky is clear if we see beyond the objective clouds. Not so much with our eyes, but with our intuition. Say the presence of your body that might seem distracting, looming there to your mind, irrefutable. That's appearing to your mental consciousness as an, a mental image via your sense consciousness. You don't, you don't have to pay attention to that. Let go of your attention to that by trying to sense the spaciousness of the mind that allows that image to arise. The spaciousness or substratum of the mind within which that image of the body is arising. Hopefully your mind is a little bit relaxed, maybe it's more tense or anxious because you're meditating for one of the first times. But within this state of mind, try to set a motivation for the class tonight, this morning. I'm going to listen to this class not simply to accumulate some information, not simply to, uh, to know a little bit more about the world, to impress others or to get a degree of some kind, but I'm going to listen with an ear to transforming myself, to become a better person to overcome my faults, to develop and increase good qualities, to really cure myself, to heal myself in a fundamental way that I can be content, satisfied, and go beyond just that to be blissfully happy. And even beyond the thought of working for our own welfare, try to open the mind to the possibility of taking the wealth, 
welfare of all other beings is our main goal, to bring about their welfare. By developing my mind, I can eventually become enlightened, fully actualized, from which state I'll have the tools, the patience, the compassion and love to work for all living beings without any self-interest. See if you can motivate that way. I'm going to listen to the teachings tonight in order to achieve that inner contentment and happiness, a state of enlightenment, in order to benefit sentient beings, not just for my own self, my own sake, but in order to benefit all living beings. And then bring your attention back to the present. How are you feeling? <coughs> any, any observations? Comments? Yeah. Yeah, that was insightful that uh, I know we get on the train of thoughts, but it's like a couch. Co uh, the train is, the couch is like uh, the coaches gaps, are the uh, gaps between, between the coaches. Yeah. Yeah, and then that's that's a that was a good break that uh, we can we have an opportunity to. Oh, nice! I, I like that analogy. Get on the train of thoughts. Mm -hmm. I hadn't heard that. Yeah, let, I may use that. I hope you haven't uh, copyrighted that. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like some rock and roll song. Getting on the train of thoughts. Or we should say getting off the train of thoughts. <laughs> <coughs> so there, yeah, there, there uh, at the beginning, when we're trying to get familiar with this nature of the mind, one way to do it is as, uh, what's, what's your name? Prashant. Prashant was saying. Uh, to notice that between thoughts that might be going through our mind, there might be moments of quiet, and just focus on that rather than the thoughts. See if you can make that space between the thoughts longer uh, at the beginning, and eventually, inevitably, you'll be distracted by some thought. Maybe sometimes just to withdraw your attention and just wait till that begins to dissipate a little and sense that quiet, hold it. At other times, uh, even when the thought is present, you know, this kind of looks like, like the shape of a chocolate eclair. <laughs> like some chocolate eclair thought is in your mind. <laughs> even at that time, when it's there and maybe, you know, distracting you and you can't quite sense the time when it will, you'll see a gap between that and some other thought, even when it's there, to sense that its very presence implies that there has to be some spaciousness right there in order for it to exist there. You know, if this were a, a, a rock, stone, or a piece of lead, let's say, something really heavy, and uh, we were to move it around and recognize that the fact that we can move it is due to the nature of space in, in a philosophical sense. Space meaning the, the absence of, of obstruction, obstructing contact. Okay? The fact that I can move it is due to the fact that there's, there's no obstruction here. Or, or to say it in a positive way, there is space here. 
So when I put the rock down, or the piece of lead down, and I ask you, where that, where that stone or lead is, is there any space left? Is there any space where this rock is? One, one part of the mind might say no, because if you try to move something else there, it's, it's obstructed. So the space is filled up. You might think there's no more space. But properly to think the fact that it exists here implies there has to be space there. Otherwise, it couldn't exist there. Space is not, it's not like water. If, if you put, if you put, uh, you know, what was it, gold in the bathtub. Remember you, you uh, who was it? You, who was it that uh, said Eureka? Archimedes. 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 Greek trying, the king had given him some chore to figure out whether the crown was made of gold or was there some impurities in it. And he, when he went in the bath and he realized that the water is displaced when you get in the bath, he realized, he figured out a way to, to determine whether the crown was pure gold or not. So, unlike water, which is displaced when you put it in it, so where the stone is or the gold is, there's no water right at that place, right? Unlike that, there is space where the stone is, where the lead is. If, it, if there were no space there, it wouldn't be able to be there. You can use the same logic in thinking about the thoughts. The very fact that there's a thought in the mind, this thought of a chocolate eclair, or your boyfriend or girlfriend, or the, whatever you're being distracted to, the fact that it's there implies that the mind is spacious. There is spaciousness of the mind right there. So it's like defocusing on that. Of course, you're not doing it with your eyes, your physical eyes, but with a, maybe the wisdom eye. As you're thinking about these thoughts, defocus on that and try to refocus on the spaciousness, spaciousness that allows that thought to be there. When you take your attention away from a thought that might be distracting you, part of your mind was multitasking, whether you wanted to or not, thinking about some nagging thoughts. As you take your attention away from them, they will begin to dissipate like a cloud in the sky. Because what propels them forward, forward, what gives them their life energy, is your attention to thoughts. So it's, a, um, it's an experience that you can have, and this may give you a lot of, a uh, very special kind of insight in meditation, that to recognize, I don't need to think about this thought. It's not going to naturally be there all the time. If I take my attention away from it, by simply, for instance, thinking of the spaciousness that allows its presence, that thought won't still be there nagging at you. It will, be, it will slowly, as you again and again distract yourself away from it, deprive it of its energy, its life energy, so to speak, your attention to it, it will begin to dissipate and temporarily, at least during that meditation session or for some time, you can find yourself in a quiet state of mind. Say, say depression or you know, strong desire or anger, whatever kind of state we find ourselves in. This is a method to clean off the tabletop, so to speak, the laboratory of your mind. I, having studied science, I like to think of the as meditation as being something that is, in a sense, very scientific. You could perform the great psychological, spiritual experiments of the past in the laboratory of your mind. You have to, to begin with, you have to clean off the tabletop of all the thoughts that are there, sort of clean out the mind of all of the usual garbage. One Buddhist scholar, contemporary Buddhist scholar, Robert Thurman, whose daughter you probably heard of, right? You know who, who his daughter is? Uma. The famous Uma. 
from it. Um, Robert Thurman refers to it sometimes as reformatting the human hard drive. Some of you geeks are smiling, some of you others who don't like to work, you know, to worry about computers, I don't want, I don't like that ex expression. So sometimes when your, uh, your hard drive gets corrupted on your computer or your solid state drive gets corrupted, you have to just erase the whole thing and start from scratch, right? And in a sense here, in a certain sense, at the beginning, meditation is a little bit like that. We like to think, I believe, you, those of you who studied Christianity, maybe you can uh, give me the correct quote, something in the Bible, Christ said, you have to be like a child. Was it, was, how does it go? There are probably several quotations. What was one? I, I don't know verbatim, but, but there were several references that you have to become like a little child. Yeah. In, with, with, in one incident, he was um, with children. The disciples thought he was wasting his time with them. He should become dealing with them. And he said, you need to become like the little children. Mm. Yeah. So not, not from a Buddhist perspective, we say not in the sense of of losing your wisdom, but maybe uh, becoming innocent again, cleaning out your hard drive. Uh, in order to fill the mind up with uh, proper thoughts, you have to sort of empty it of all of our preconceptions. So when the thoughts are coming, you can look at the, the gap between the thoughts, hold on to that. Even when the thoughts are present, uh, with your, in, your wisdom, or you could also say intuition, I guess, in a sense, recognize that there has to be space there and try to hold that as you deprive the thought of its, of its uh, attention, it will begin to disappear. And you can, again, get a very strong uh, sense of that spacious, spaciousness. We'll be, doing, excuse me, we'll be doing that meditation many times. So, the, the topic that we're going to investigate within this spaciousness of, of our mind is the, the fact of our inevitable demise, death, and uh, the process of dying, and what happens after that. Uh, it's interesting that I believe this is the one of the re the suggested readings for the course. It's one in the same book, which has, uh, from my point of view, naughtily, in a naughty sense, the author, the publishers, have come out with a different title. I think this was the original one: "Mind of Clear Light: Advice on Living Well and Dying Consciously." I like that title very much. Uh, also, the picture of his holiness. This one is, little, this is the newer edition, Advice on Dying and Living a Better Life. Inside, it has the same photo on the back, but uh, the mind of clear light is what we were just talking about. So, what is death and what's, its, uh, what's the purpose of attending to it in a, in a course in Buddhism? To the, in the Western point of view, sometimes death is, we kind of think of it as kind of a morbid subject. You know, it's, it's sort of like something you want to keep out of your awareness. It's, it's certainly not something that's pleasant. Often, most of the time, we don't like to think about suffering. You know, if we're not suffering something already, we don't want to contemplate uh, the possible sufferings that could exist. Um, death being the ultimate one as in terms of a human being, losing this life. From a Buddhist perspective, death is, is, has a very particular meaning. Death is the uh, leaving of the continuity of mind. And I'll talk more about that. From a body in which it's inhabited. Um, <clears throat> right now we have a body, we have a mind. At the time of death, the gross mind that we're experiencing now 
has all become very, very subtle, like, like at the time of deep sleep. At the time of deep, of deep sleep, your eyes and ears and nose and so forth are not functioning. In a sense, the energy that propels them to the, the senses, the consciousnesses, have absorbed, we say, to a central location in the body. Not the brain, uh, kind of like the heart, the heart chakra, where a subtle most mind resides that we're, we're not ordinarily aware of. And it's also, it also has the same kind of nature that we've been looking at in our gross mind, this clear light nature, but on a much more subtle level. That mind has been imbued or, or stained or uh, with the imprints of our actions, our karma. And it's that subtle most mind that at the time of death leaves a body at which time the person is said to be dead. I saw somewhere, I'm not sure if it's in the book or some other statement somewhere, that there is nobody who is dead. You know, like, can you say, uh, say, Uncle Frank is, is there anyone named Frank here? I don't want to be too personal if there's someone there. <laughs> Uncle Frank's body is lying there and he's just breathed, breathed his last a couple of minutes ago and then someone says, Uncle Frank is dead. Does Uncle Frank exist any longer? No. Why not? His soul exists. So his, his, soul. Well, maybe, maybe in the Vedic traditions we might say his soul exists. When Buddha, we'll, we'll, we'll debate about that as time goes on, if you've got the, the, the continuity to, to keep on coming. Um, something is left. So Uncle Frank, we could say Uncle Frank's body is there, but Uncle Frank doesn't exist any longer. He may, his consciousness that's left the body, doesn't think, I am Uncle Frank. You know, doesn't think, oh, we're, you know, still thinking of, of the life experiences. A very subtle mind uh, that's existed from other lifetimes, when he has been a woman, when he's been a dog, when he's been a hell being, when he's been a god in the past. That subtle consciousness that's inhabited all of those various lifetimes has left the body. That's called death, from a Buddhist perspective. Now, why is, why is death the topic of this unit of uh, discovering Buddhism? Well, for many reasons. In one sense, one of the most powerful insights that we can have, realizations that we can have, is the realization of impermanence. Do you know what impermanence means? The, the changing of things. Uh, momentarily, uh, well, let's say big rocks out on the beach or in, in the side of the, of the hill. Uh, if you think about it, you can recognize that they are impermanent because Eventually, they will erode, maybe due to temperatures and so forth. They'll crack and uh, break up into pieces, become gravel or whatever. But even every moment, they're changing. The molecules within them, the atoms and so forth. We differentiate between subtle impermanence and a grosser impermanence, gross impermanence. If we can recognize the nature, our nature, as being impermanent in this subtle sense and focus on that, that, that is an incredibly powerful insight to have to overcome problems. Overcoming problems and also to develop good qualities. My teacher, Lama Yeshi, one of the founders of, the, of this organization, we call the Foundation for the Preservation of the Mahayana Tradition, FPMT, or as some people say, FMPT. <laughs> <laughs> you know, 
all these acronyms, the first time you hear them, you reverse the letters, right? So, uh, only someone who's, who's, <laughs> would, would find it funny who's, <laughs> who has been in the organization for some time. Um, Lama Yesh used to say, realization of impermanence is kind of like an atom bomb to blow up our delusions. That insight, uh, those of you who've, who have maybe been familiar with Buddhism know that one of the deep insights of the Buddha that can lead to total eradication of our delusions is a, a certain wisdom consciousness that recognizes what's called emptiness or shunyata. Have any of you heard of that? Shunyata. Emptiness. Shunya means empty in Sanskrit. Shunyata means the state of being empty or emptiness. Also, uh, anatama. So this will be this will be a little bit. Well, maybe we can have some discussion back and forth because you were talking about at, you were saying soul, which is in Sanskrit means atma. The Buddha the Buddha said anatama, no soul. So what's that about? Anyway, that that insight is said to be one that can bring about a cessation, an ending of all our delusions slowly by, by recognizing there's no ego the way that we think. There's no controller of the body and mind behind the body and mind. You know, sort of the observer, the taster. You know, you, the reason you put a piece of chocolate on your tongue is not simply that your tongue consciousness be pleasantly you know, experienced, but that I experience the chocolate, sort of the taster, the person back there who's the owner of the body and mind. That's our motivator all the time, the sense of I. If you can recognize uh, the illusory nature of that, you can be freed very, in a very fundamental way. But that realization is very difficult to, to acquire, to develop. It's very subtle. <coughs> On the other hand, impermanence, to recognize that the things that we ordinarily encounter in the world, our self, our relationships, uh, the things that we find attractive or irritating, all of them are impermanent. That in itself can act as also the wisdom that understands that. We're talking about an insight in the mind, wisdom, that understands impermanence. Not just the fact of impermanence, but understanding that. Because impermanence is there whether you understand it or not, right? The wisdom that understands impermanence can bring about a, a, a credible liberation. You know, recognizing that all this will pass. So I'll do this thing. Some many years ago, when I was in, uh, next, I was uh, living in Beirut, Lebanon, teaching at an American school there, and uh, one of my dear friends and I shared a house up in the mountains above Beirut, um, and uh, my friend uh, invited a, a, a buddy of his from South Carolina to visit. Or maybe the buddy invited himself. I think that was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the friend's name was Fireball. But I sometimes got mixed up and I said, Was he from North Carolina or South Carolina? And they said, If his name is Fireball, he's from South Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> so Fireball had, uh, <laughs> had somehow interested my friend in uh, mailing back to the States. Uh, some of the Lebanese drug hashish. They had rolled out with rolling pins, very, very thin, and uh, put aluminum foil on it and sent it in Christmas cards to their friends to see if it would get through, <laughs> went through. I didn't know this at the time. And, uh, I swear to God. And, uh, <laughs> then they had a plan, unbeknownst to me, because uh, I was a school teacher and I, they probably thought I was, would, pour water on their plan. They planned to make, uh, and they did make, pigeon cages, a uh, piece of very thin 
a laminate of wood, then a layer of hashish, then another layer of wood, and, and they were going to send this back to the States thinking that the smell of the pigeons would prevent the customs from recognizing. Well, they got the, 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 car the Lebanese carpenter turned them in, who was making their thing, and I got a phone call that uh, my friend's name was Steve, and Steve and Fireball were in prison. And uh, unfortunately, at the time, I didn't have the equanimity of mind to think so much about Fireball's fate. Uh, he'd been uh, <laughs> a bit of a thorn in my side, but I was worried about Steve. I went to see him in the, the jail after a couple of days when it was finally could be seen. And there were, I remember the bars, it was out in a courtyard, and one person at a time would be brought there, and you could go up to the bars and talk to them. I said, Steve, how are you? Because I'd already heard, he was a handsome guy, I'd, I'd heard that he'd been molested and not only beaten, but physically, sexually molested or whatever in his prison. And he looked a bit drawn, but he said, he, he quoted a line that he and I had been reading in the, some Sufi literature. He said, this too will pass. Yeah. You ever heard, I think in many religions, there's uh, some similar kind of sentiment. This too will pass. Impermanence. That simple understanding prevented, you know, incredible anguish in the mind. You know, it was somehow liberating. This will pass. This will go away. This is impermanent. And this is just, just to give you an idea. You, you can probably think from your own experience of times when an insight like that might be have been helpful, or was helpful, or could have been helpful had you had you had access to it at that time. So, if we can recognize that things are changing every moment and will eventually change, that, that insight is very valuable. The, between subtle impermanence and gross impermanence, it's more easy, it's easier to understand gross impermanence. You know, if you drop a ceramic cup on the floor and it breaks into many pieces and you see that before your eyes, you recognize that's changed. That, that was impermanent. That was kind of a sign that it's impermanent. But of course it was changing every moment before that, but sometimes because every moment what arises is so similar to what was there the moment before, we don't recognize that impermanence, right? You only notice often when there's a big change, or there's a chip in the cup, or there's a, a ding on the car, or... In, in Washington, D.C., do you use the expression being keyed? You know, your car was keyed, or something like that. Someone was annoyed with you, left a scratch on it. You see, you know, a change, a gross change. But the car was changing every moment before that. In the case of our life, the gross impermanence that... that we can obviously recognize is death. If we can't recognize and understand and come to grips with death, it would be very difficult to understand the subtle change of our mind and body from moment to moment. So this is one reason for uh, understanding death, for investigating it in a, in a a sense it's a doorway to understanding subtle impermanence, to investigate gross impermanence in the most personal sense of it. Not talking about cups or cars, but yourself. I'm eventually going to die. In another sense, in the stages of development of the mind, in Buddhist meditation, there have been great Buddhist saints that uh, followed the historical Buddha some 2,500 years ago. Over time, they understood all of his discourses. They're called the sutras, various teachings that the Buddha gave. And they could put them in, you know, they put them together in the proper way to be practiced because the Buddha spoke, when he did speak, he spoke on individual occasions to particular people uh, to answer particular questions and uh, in context of, of various things. 
So over time, there developed a sequence of teachings. How to, how to practice. How to, what you do at the beginning, what you do in the middle, what you do at the end of your practice. I don't mean one meditation session, but in one person's practice over a lifetime, or many lifetimes. How, how to develop the mind. We could say the stages of the path. You know, step by step. One of the first things that these great Indian saints uh, took from the Buddha's discourses as a beginning orientation was a meditation that would have been one of the modules in this Discovering Buddhism course earlier. Some of you may have taken that. Some of you may have just be coming now for the first time. But the topic was recognizing the, the what we what we call this life of leisure and endowment. Or um, sometimes you could say the perfect human rebirth that we have. You might think, oh, my life's not so perfect. Uh, or maybe you think it is very perfect for different reasons. From a Buddhist perspective, we, we use these two words, leisure and endowment, in, this, in the following sense. We have leisure in the sense that we're free. We have leisure from states that we have been born in many times, numberless times in the past. We've been born in hell, numberless times. In which case, the suffering is so intense, so continuous, there's no way that we could turn our mind to spiritual matters. We've been born as spirits, uh, some of whom are so overcome with want and unfulfilled desires, looking for water, never even being able to find a drop. Uh, they're so overcome with this that they're, there's no time to, uh, no opportunity to practice spirituality. We could be, we've been born as animals, this unfree state, a state of no leisure. You might think your poodle has a lot of leisure, or your, you know, your your pet cat or something. And you see on TV sometimes you might think that they're a very luxurious state. But from a Buddhist perspective, it wouldn't be a great thing to be born as an animal, even something in as uh, advantageous state as a Washington or New York cat or dog. <laughs> because the mind is, uh, even if you tell your cat or dog, you should practice the Dharma. <laughs> You know, you should be good. Don't kill the birds. They'll smile at you and wag their tail, and they'll go out and continue killing the birds, uh, the mice or whatever. Um, even if you try to inculcate them in some very basic virtuous practices, they can't understand. The mind is, uh, at that point, within that aggregate of a body, the, the mind is not capable of, of, uh, that in, of insights into developing practice. So that's also an unfree state. Even the gods, other than the, the humans, in a sense are unfree states because sometimes there's so much luxury. It's like someone uh, being born in uh, a, a very wealthy family, never seeing suffering. You go in, the, the son or daughter is put into the limousine, the shades are drawn, and you go through the slum, and then the, slate, the shades are put up, you go into the parking lot, up the elevator, you never experience the sufferings of life. Everything you want is delivered to you very quickly. Very difficult to, view, to develop compassion for others, to develop a sense of renunciation. So the human lifetime the human life is said to be one of uh, leisure from these unfree states. You know, we've got, a, we've got a, a moment now between extreme suffering and extreme luxury where we can kind of uh, find a quiet space to develop our mind. In addition to that, we're endowed with certain qualities that are necessary to practice. Not endowed with, when you think of endowment, you think of like, you know, you have a $2 million endowment or, you know, your, um, your grand uncle left you so-and-so, 
not, not endowment like that, but endowed with a, a human body, with an intellect, your, uh, hmm, you're born in a religious country where the teachings are available. In this case, let's say Buddhism. Other spiritual practices are, 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 are around. You're not born amongst barbarians that are uh, totally against the practice of religion. If, if we were born in a place like that, like for instance, in maybe a decade ago in communist China, maybe even now today in communist China, but in communist China when religion was being persecuted entirely. Be very, it, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't have the freedom, the endowment to practice very easily. If at all, it would have to be done in secret and very small amounts. Here, we can practice openly. Uh, it's said that we're, we're fortunate to be endowed with the presence of the teachings that still exist in the world. There have been times in the past, and there will be times in the future, when spiritual teachings that are alive and vibrant don't exist any longer. There might be books and libraries that people would think, oh, look at what they meditated on, in the what they read in the past, you know, but there'll be no taste of what those teachings mean. There'll be no practitioners. We're born at a time, we have this endowment or richness of being born at a time when there are still beings who practice these teachings, put them into practice. The Buddha, uh, descended upon this world and the, his teachings still exist in a vibrant form. There are spiritual people that provide a co community and resources, like the center here, providing the resources for you to come and listen to this. These are all kind of richness that we have, that we're endowed with. <clears throat> so at the very beginning of the spiritual path, this is the one of the things that we uh, come to investigate and to meditate on and it, recognizing what we have can give a completely different perspective to our lives. We can use this life not only to find real satisfaction, real contentment, blissful happiness, to become completely content with everyone, become a friend of everyone. We can, we can also work on the the stages to develop enlightenment in our own mind. Perfect state, so yeah, omniscience. I think in the Abrahamic religions, at least in Christianity, they talk about different qualities of God. Uh, omniscient, omnipotent, and... Omnipresent. Omnipresent, right? Omnis, lots of omnis. Omni means all-encompassing, right? Omniscient means knowing everything. Omnipotent means having all potency, all power, all powerful. Omnipresence means present everywhere. You don't have to, in the, in the church, you don't have to invite God down from somewhere up there. He's present everywhere. Well, we, we say the same qualities exist to our eventual Buddhahood. When we become enlightened beings, or Buddhas, Buddha just means an enlightened being, we will have those same qualities. Not the same sense of omnipotence that you might think of creating souls or wreaking down vengeance upon those who don't treat you the right way or something, but uh, having all power that's possible. So the, in, at the beginning, to, to meditate on this can give a, a new perspective to our life, meditating on the value of this life that we find ourselves in. When, once we recognize what we have, it's a little bit like someone not knowing that they have a valuable thing. You have this, what is it, the, on TV, the something road show, or so something on public TV where the people bring in these okay. things and they antique find show. out. Was it? Antique show. Antique show, maybe, yeah. yeah. Antique yeah. road show. Antique road show, there we go. <laughs> yeah. So you bring in something, usually the people have some suspicion it's worth something, but they always look amazed when it's worth $20,000. Oh, I had no idea. Well, just recognize that you have right now. You know, it's like, you kind of have a feeling it might be something worthwhile here, and then you're, you're, you come to realize what a value, what a valuable opportunity, rare opportunity you have as a human right now. Rare, we'll talk about. Why it's so rare. You say, wow, 
maybe the same thing as in the antique Rosh, but much more so. <laughs> it's not just $20,000. You can use this life to achieve enlightenment, to overcome all the problems you've encountered in the past, all the things you thought were unsurmountable. But the teachings that we're talking about now are a, a, a counterpoint to that. This life has a duration. It's not, it will definitely end. We will die. This perfect human rebirth, not, not to rain on your parade, <laughs> but it will end. And that can, that itself, that insight itself, then can motivate you not to waste time. Otherwise, you can just think, ah, oh, I'm all right. I've got a perfect human rebirth. I'm going to go to bed. <laughs> and sleep on it. <laughs> I'm going to go to you know on vacation and, and just think about how lucky I am, rather than using it. When you recognize that it's changing every moment, that it will eventually end, and that after this lifetime, when the, the subtle consciousness leaves this body, Jeffrey Hopkins, I think in maybe this book, the, the translator of the Dalai Lama's teachings. He mentions, uh, or in another place, he mentions how at the time of death, there's a Tibetan expression, uh, like a hair drawn out from butter. I mean, that, that would mean nothing, nothing to us probably, but in, in Tibet, butter was a very important thing. The, uh, the female yak is called dri. Uh, milk uh, was churned into butter, so they, they call it dimar. You, sometimes people think in Tibetan tea, there's yak butter. The Tibetans laugh because the yak is the male. It's like saying bull milk. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the dimar, the, the female yak butter, uh, often would be packed for long journeys in, in some leather covering and might get a little bit rancid over time, but it was they would always have some to put into their tea in these very high altitudes. Very, very nutritious and very good tasting in their sampa, their cereal. Dimar. But sometimes in the middle you would find a yak hair because when it was, was milked and through the process of churning and everything, something slipped in there. But when you pull that hair out, it came out without leaving, you know, it came out completely all by itself. There was no butter, maybe, you know, some molecules of butter on the surface, but it just came out by itself. They say that at the time of death, the mind leaves the body like a hair for, drawn from butter. Now you'll know what that means. <laughs> so after this lifetime, this perfect human lifetime, when we have this leisure, we can practice, we can read, we can meditate, we can create virtuous karma consciously that we might otherwise never have thought to do. Consciously develop the, the habit of being generous. Consciously hone our ethics and become uh, less harmful to others, abstaining from negative actions, creating virtuous actions, all of these things. We can do so much this lifetime, but it, it comes to an end, and at that time when the mind leaves this body, we're under the influence of our former actions, but we may not even remember our karma, the karmic instincts and seeds upon our consciousness that will propel us to our next life. Maybe, we don't know right now, maybe even if we have the best intentions, we'll be born as an animal or as a hell being in the next lifetime. Difficult to know. But if we, if we practice in a very powerful way, we can begin to change that situation of unknowing. We can develop more confidence that we've reduced our negative karma. We can purify the negative karmic instincts in our mind. It's like paying off your debts. And we can develop a bank account, if you will, of positive, maybe that's a good thing for a modern you know, credit card society. We can develop credit rating of positive karma on our mind stream. Do you know the word karma? Does anyone not know the word karma? Some of you were here for the first time, I think. Does anyone not know? Don't be afraid to say. Karma is an Indian word, Sanskrit word, that means action. Karma. 
So in Buddhism, the, when the Buddha taught about uh, karma, he used the phrase karma phala. Karma phala. Phala means effect or result or fruit, harvest. So karma and its result. In the West, we usually say cause and result or cause and effect, right? Cause and effect. Yeah. Cause and effect, right? Mm -hmm. Newton's was it third law of motion says for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. Did I get that right? The third, third law? Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. Have you ever heard that before? Yeah. Every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. If you're on the skating rink and uh, you're tr trying to tease someone, you come up behind a friend who's on their skates and you push them thinking that they'll be pushed away, you'll also be pushed back, right? Every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. If you throw a ball against the wall, the, the wall uh, provides a, although the force is prov provided to the wall by the ball hitting it, the wall pushes back the opposite way. In a sense, we create actions that will have a similar kind of reaction upon us. I think the best explanation of karma is uh, in, a, in a short sentence is what Christ said in supposedly in the New Testament uh, you, you reap what you sow or as you sow so shall ye reap right? maybe nowadays they translate it just you get what you deserve I don't know how they <laughs> translate it. Uh, you know what that means if you, if you plant the seeds of an orange tree you're not going to get apple tree if you plant poisonous seed, uh, seeds of poisonous plants, thorny plants, you can't expect to have beautiful medicinal plants or fruit trees or, you know, coming up. So what we want to be able to do is create seeds in our consciousness of actions that are positive, being generous, being kind, loving, caring, patient, and so forth, and the, the result of that is in the future, maybe not necessarily this lifetime, but in some lifetime, that mind stream, our mind stream, the present mind stream, will experience the fruits of those, the harvest of that. We will reap what we, what we had sown. It's clear? Right? So karma and its result is, is uh, how in Buddhism we talk about, and the psychic level, cause and effect. So why do we why do we study about death? Well, in this in this sense to recognize that this perfect human rebirth will have an end and that we better get you know, we better take advantage of it while we have the chance. Why don't we take a, a short break? Um, can we use the restroom have something to drink, maybe five minute stretch if you want. Go out, get some air. Okay. How are you doing? Okay. Oh yeah, take your time. Take your time. I'll just see well, for a couple of minutes. See if anyone has any questions from the first part of our talk here tonight, or observations, anything you'd like to correct or ask about? Yes. What's, what's your name? Uh, Matt. Hey, Matt. Hi. Right. Um, I don't know if this is something you want to address now, but I think you might be like uniquely qualified to. Um, like something that I, like, tr not troubles me, but I wonder a lot is, um, especially like in our culture, like the like materialist type of point of view, that your, your mind is like a epiphenomenon of the brain, like an emergent property of the brain, and then when the brain dies, you know, that seems to be pretty much most people's view. And um, is there anything you can say on like how you can kind of uh, get over that kind of like condition to kind of feel like that's... Yeah, good question. Uh, I've forgotten the exact terminology, but I remember this expression, epiphenomena. Uh, sometimes there are, apparently there are kind of three main, probably many variations, but three main ideas that either the mind is synonymous 
with the body in some sense, either is the brain or is the flow of energy currents through our nervous system, something like that, or it's an emergent phenomena that emerges once those things have been created, you know, so that once the brain has come into existence, a new kind of thing uh, called the mind can be posited as a result of that. Uh, like um, if you're making, if you take a bunch of pieces of wood that are relatively uh, flexible, but you place them in some array, cross them, and you put screws or nails in them, it becomes a very solid structure. Some new thing arises from something that was not there before. Is that the epiphenomena? That's epi, yeah. the yeah, emergent. Yeah, like, exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, a th from a Buddhist perspective, uh, that mind is of a different nature than the body. Uh, so, it's not synonymous with physical, is not even emergent from that physical, dependent upon the physical to exist, but of a different nature. This is something uh, that you have to investigate. And uh, you might say it's uh, something that's uh, taken for granted, but it's something that you can recognize. When we look at the, at the nature of the mind in our meditation at the beginning, what we're investigating is what Buddhism would call the conventional nature of the mind, as opposed to its ultimate nature, its emptiness. I'm just talking about just its bare quality, like looking at the microphone or looking at the wristwatch, investigating its conventional qualities. Here, the mind is not something that we've investigated in our own experience very often, only in a gross sense. Here we're turning the attention inward with meditation. Very, very unique kind of experience that we can have. That's why I, I, I use the expression, the laboratory of the mind. Because Western science might like to say that um, I, you know, with the apparatus that I have to measure from the outside what we purport to be conscious phenomena, it has certain qualities that seem to be attributable to the brain or the nervous system. So they would either surmise that it is the, the, the brain or nervous system or it's an epiphenomena arising from it. And they're a little bit uh, dismissive. Some are a little, dis, a little bit dismissive of interior observation, subjective observation, because it, that can't be reproduced. You know, the person says, I feel this. You know, how can you verify they feel that or they, I, I see this or that? But the Dalai Lama has been having this dialogue with Western science and especially psychologists and uh, brain scientists for a couple of decades now and continues to do so. Just a couple of weeks ago there was another episode, I believe in, uh, where was it? Maybe it was in Dharamsala in India. Uh, that was broadcast. You could watch, you could listen to it live on the on the web. Um, <coughs> he's been having a dialogue with the West to try to investigate this, to try to get people to open up their uh, acceptance, their 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 mind to this possibility that the consciousness itself is of a different nature than material. From Buddhist perspective, there are three kinds of things that are impermanent. We were talking about impermanence, gross impermanence right now, death. The person is impermanent, you might say. So, three kinds of things that are impermanent. Material, matter, changing every moment. It has its own continuity. Uh, it can be transformed into energy. We know from, you know, you probably studied in, in science, you can transform matter into energy, or pure energy can uh, be uh, transformed back into matter. Remember Einstein's E equals MC squared. Matter and energy equivalence somehow. But in, from Buddha's perspective, there is another phenomena, another phenomenon, which is impermanent, which is consciousness, which is not material. 
the consciousness itself is not created or transformed from matter. You can't create consciousness out of matter. Uh, consciousness does not later transform back into matter. And, uh, you know, if I just said that as an axiom, as a statement, you might say, okay, well, that fits. Then, then the, um, the consciousness at the time of birth has to have come not from the union of the fertilized egg, the, the union of the father's sperm and mother's egg, or any chemicals that were added at the time, but if it was of a, if it's of a different nature, the material, it had to be in, had had a previous continuity of a similar kind before consciousness, conscious continuity. But how do you how do you prove that? How do you prove that the mind has that that <coughs> nature? That's something you can prove in your own experience. Watch the mind. It's this clear light nature of the mind as having no obstructive nature to it. Any, any uh, thoughts that are there at one moment, they can be eliminated in an instant. This can start to give you a, a, a feeling of the possibility of this nature of the mind as being different than the nature of matter. It's not, it has no obstructive quality like material does. Um, there are, you know, other kinds of observations you can make. If you develop clairvoyance, you can actually s recall past lives and see that the consciousness has come from the past, existed in other lives in the past. At a certain point when people develop clairvoyance, they can even uh, perceive some continuity in the future. Not maybe perhaps the every exact event until Buddhahood, but uh, one can see some kind of continuity in the future. When we talk about past lives and future lives, uh, sometimes we, this is getting a little, this all related subjects to the same thing. Sometimes we think, uh, well, I don't remember my past life or past lives, I don't see them. If they were there, you'd think I'd see them. Uh, and my 20, 21st century, I want to say 20th century, we're in the 21st century now, my 21st century gurus, quote unquote, the scientists, maybe for some people it's the stock market gurus, I don't <laughs> know, but you know, from a certain sense it's the people who put us on the moon and make new computers and stuff, the scientists, physicists, chemists, biologists, in the laboratory with their instruments, they don't perceive past lives. This is the, the doubt that comes in our mind. I don't, scientists don't, none of them, quote, hard scientists or the people I consider my gurus, you know, not these wafty religious people. <laughs> uh, none of them perceive past and future lives, so therefore they don't exist. But ask yourself, is it, is it uh, sufficient to say that something is not perceived? Does that necessitate that it doesn't exist? It's not perceived? No, say, say, for instance, um, these lights make a bit of a hum. Let's imagine that the lights are off in this room, and the sh the, there's no light coming in, and all of you are entirely silent. You're meditating as we were before. You guys are pretty quiet. Okay? So someone were to whisper to me, is there anyone in the room? And I would look out, the room is dark, I don't see anyone. I listen, I don't hear anyone, and just from my position I can't feel anyone. I said, no, no, there's no one here. Would that, that wouldn't be a valid observation, obviously, because I'm at that point, I'm not in a position to really verify whether there are objects of sight there, because it's dark. I'm not, ver I, I can't verify that there's no objects that make sound because uh, they're silent right at the moment. So you can ask yourself, do the scientists or ourselves who claim that there are no past and future lives actually see the past 
you know, like it was brightly illuminated and see that there's no lives there? Or is it a case like this being, you know, eyes shut or blinded or whatever, and not seeing the past, and then just saying, because I don't know the past, there's no past. Yeah, there's no past. There's no past life. Uh, on this concept, I had doubt. So, uh, the book by Dr. Brian Weiss, he's a psychologist who did uh, clinical hypnotherapy on his patients. He has uh, written many books on past life, many lives and many uh, souls, many lives, uh, masters of uh, souls. It talks about past lives and uh, he has given examples of his patients with copyright that they are right and that can give light to the fact that there are lives mm. that exist. Yeah, I, mean, I, um, I, like, I, I don't think, like, I, I, uh, I guess I can say, like, I, my, my problem is I can't get past, like, an intellectual belief in the, in the past and future lives. Like, I don't think material, I think a materialist view is a, as metaphysical as any religious view is. I mean, there's no proof for that either, like you're saying. Yeah. And, um, but it's like, I can't get, like, the, especially, like, in terms, like, with the pronunciation of this life and everything, I can't get, like, a, like a right. visceral well, feeling. Well, is it, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get to that point. So, uh, let me make a little diversion here. Sometime in the debating courtyard, when we're debating about Buddhist concepts, the reason we debate is to hone the understanding. You know, your opponent might even take a wrong position to try to see if you understand something correctly. Not out of malice, but uh, to try to hone our, our own understanding. But sometimes in the, in the debating courtyard, someone else is holding a position which is not correct. Uh, and uh, one way of... You, you can't necessarily propose to them the, or, or just teach them the correct view. Sometimes you have to, because their mind is so holding on to something else. You can even think of it in the political realm today, you know, in Washington here. Uh, before you can propose something that's really positive or correct, you have to uh, let that person let go of that which erroneous thing that they're holding to. So one way to do that is to propose to them some absurd consequences of their position. And when they think of that, they start to think, well, maybe that what I'm holding on to, I don't mean with the hands, but intellectually, is not exactly right. And at that moment, then you can propose something that's positive, you correct view. So this is what I'm saying. This is simply to help to overcome some things that our mind might be holding to. Ask yourself, do I see the past and recognize that there's no lives there? Do the scientists and so forth? I'm not. I'm, I'm not asking. A, this is a rhetorical no, question. I, you, you don't have to. You don't have to answer. Uh, and of course, we would recognize that. Yeah, no, no one. None of these people would claim they see the past and see that there's no life there. So that itself is not a proof. That's just opening up the possibility then. Then you can say, well, maybe, okay, in that case, maybe there are lives, but what's the positive proof for it? So, um, there, are, there are many examples over the history of time of, of individuals, young individuals, usually when they're quite young, before the age of four or five, around that time, when they can speak, but they are uh, not yet encumbered with the intellectual apparatus of this lifetime, that they can recall past lifetimes. It sometimes can be people that had a violent death, that had a strong memory. It, it can be sometimes spiritual beings that have practiced strongly in the past. Uh, there's a lot of, there are a lot of uh, hokey kind of things like, who is this movie star? There's some lady movie star. With Shirley MacLaine. Shirley MacLaine. You know, the books, you know. I, I, I hope I didn't offend someone saying hokey movie star if you're a fan of Shirley MacLaine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, there's things that all oh, the people saying, I was, I was King Tut. How many people were King Tut, you know, that claim to have been Cleopatra or, you know, some kind of thing in the past? From a Buddhist perspective, that's very unlikely. It's very unlikely even through hypnosis, from Buddhist perspective. 
But there have been some, uh, there were some people down in Duke University in the last 20, 30 years that have done experiments for many decades chronicling young uh, children who would have memories of their past lives and then investigating. Sometimes a child would remember, I planted a treasure in the field behind my house and they would try to determine where that house was and they'd go to the field, they'd find a treasure that was buried there or something. Many, many kinds of things like this. But really, uh, sometimes it has to be something in our own sphere of experience that brings us about to this. So that, that we know someone like a, like a spiritual being who's passed away. <clears throat> we meet their reincarnation and we sense <clears throat> some continuity of consciousness, some snippets of conversations that you had in the past. My teacher, Lama Yeshe, died when he was 49 at a young age because he had had a, the same illness my mom had, something called uh, mitral stenosis. She had, he had had rheumatic fever when he was a child that left some scarring on the heart. So he died young. And his reincarnation uh, was discovered, was recognized, we say in Buddhism, not selected or chosen or elected, but recognized. Uh, through a process that's in the Tibetan tradition, recognized by the Dalai Lama, as a little Spanish boy. When, when Lama was alive, he'd, he'd, at a certain point in the early, late 70s, he asked me to go to England to our center there, Manjushri Institute, to uh, help coordinate the spiritual program. There was a Lama that was teaching there, and a couple of Lamas, and to take part in the study program. What, what we thought we would become Geshe's, we would get Geshe degrees. It was called the Geshe program. So I, before I left the monastery in Nepal, I, I came to Lama, I made three prostrations, and I, I requested him if he had any advice, because we were going off to this big study program, intellectual study program. Lama thought for a minute and he said, intellectual Mount Meru isn't worth kaka. I don't know if you know what Mount Meru is. Mount Meru, Sumeru is considered, and also in Vedic <coughs> philosophy and Buddhist philosophy, to be the center of the universe upon which the continents are surrounded and so forth. So, so he was saying that uh, you know, intellectual knowledge is, is it, it, by itself is not as worth as much as excrement which you can use to fertilize the fields. So to really try to Whatever you study, to try to take the essence and put it into your, you know, use it for your own development of good heart and wisdom and so forth. And many years later, <clears throat> when the little boy, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> when Lama Yeshe's reincarnation was identified, recognized, and he was about four years old. We, we were in Italy at this time at a center there, Istituto Lama Zoncapa. And he was riding around on his tricycle, and people were talking to him, playing with him. Then he came around me. I was staying off, standing off to the side. <clears throat> and as he came around, I said, Lama, do you have anything to say to me? We called him Lama. He was a little four-year-old boy. <laughs> and he whispered up to me. He said, I don't know anything about caca. <laughs> <laughs> now, Lama Yeshi had said, intellectual Mount, Mount Meru isn't worth caca. So someone else could say, Completely your own imagination, you know. Uh, what do they call it? Uh, I can't remember the term for that. Just something that happens, and you're you're surmising that there's some cause and effect, <clears throat> some relationship. But many people have had experiences like that with reincarnations. Uh, one of the tutors of the Dalai Lama, the present Dalai Lama, who, 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 the, the tutor himself has passed away many years ago. His name was Serkon Sinchab Rinpoche. So Serka Senchab Rinpoche was once uh, meeting with a Western scholar who had done his PhD thesis on uh, Buddhist proofs of reincarnation. Where we're talking about the mind having clear light nature and so forth. <clears throat> he put the thesis before Rinpoche. Rinpoche put it on the side table and the person put it back in front of Rinpoche. And <laughs> And uh, he said, well, this is very important. Isn't this, isn't this proof that reincarnation exists? And Rinpoche said, uh, you know, 
I've studied all of these proofs in the monastery, just as we're hearing about them now, but never really convinced, you know, really moved my mind. But I knew the 13th Dalai Lama very intimately. He was my teacher. And when he passed away and the 14th Dalai Lama was recognized, I knew this was the same person. Not just like by propaganda, but really even approaching it with a skeptical mind. Uh, there, were, there was some continuity of consciousness. So other than actually having clairvoyance that we can remember past lifetimes, just on the experiential level, this is, this is something that can begin to open the mind. Sometimes individuals that have from uh, their youth some special qualities that are not genetic in that family, uh, prodigies you might say, or spiritual qualities. Some kids are out on the sidewalk with a hammer happily smashing the ants or rock, smiling. Other kids, any animal that's injured, they feel, you know, you can see some kind of trepidation and fear and, and unhappiness. They, they really care about others. <clears throat> From a certain sense, the, the, the world view that encompasses past lives and reincarnation might be one that is, um, you know, a choice. Let's say, we might say there's, could, let's say possibly just in this sense, three choices. Let's say that view, reincarnation and karma, that determines our things, or the, so the Abrahamic religions. Christianity, Judaism, Islam, and so forth, where there was a creator God who created our soul at the time of, sometime in the time of birth, whatever you want to debate about, whether it's at the, you know, inside, outside, whatever. That's another, perhaps another view, or this so-called scientific view, where there's God is, you know, for suckers, or, you know, Buddhism is for suckers, and it's just, thank you, just evolution of, you know, cause, you know, the, the, the brain is a, the mind is a, either synonymous with the body and mind or an epiphenomena. The Dalai Lama has said that, uh, you know, there are these different views uh, may fit different mind streams, different people, from a Buddhist perspective, depending upon our instincts from past lives. Some of us may really be able to practice virtue on the basis of the belief in a creator God or practice being good-hearted, even believing in a secular sense, that there is no God, there is no you know, deeper purpose or enlightenment or rebirth. But for some of us, the, the Buddhist worldview, and he said he's referring to himself also, sort of explains everything. Why there are prodigies? You know, because this individual has left instincts in their mind in that particular playing the piano or mathematics or Buddhism or whatever, in past lives, there's some instinct that is awakened in this lifetime. So when we see spiritual beings <clears throat> that have these kind of qualities <clears throat> that can, can sort of, you know, from that perspective, we can start to look at things in a different way. Maybe this makes sense with the existence of past lives. Until we can actually experience that with our clairvoyance or perhaps second-hand way recognize someone that we knew intimately the reincarnation of someone and see that continuity of consciousness and be have some confidence that way um, we have to depend on logic to a certain degree or our own intuition you know that this this worldview explains better than other things. I'll say one more thing, then I'll, I'll, I'll uh, address a question for you. Once when the Dalai Lama was leaving England, <clears throat> he, uh, he had met with the Archbishop of Canterbury, who's the head of the Anglican Church, right? Christian Church there. And uh, His Holiness has very good relationship in general with leaders of all the religions, especially the popes in the past and so forth. 
So he was at the airport and the, uh, not paparazzi exactly, but the newspaper people always like to get some juice, juicy tidbits, especially nowadays in the, the 10, sec 10 second sound bite era, you know, they're, they're saying, yeah, Your Holiness, what do you think of God? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's more of a New York accent, I can't remember. <laughs> I don't have my British accent now. And His Holiness said, God is your problem. Karma is mine. And I think the first part kind of shocked them. They thought he was just, you know, God is your problem, you know, like, it's just a problem. But we, whatever worldview we have, there's going to be something that's uh, philosophically, psychologically problematic. You know, why could greater God, compassionate God, allow this suffering? You know, there's all, all sorts of things. For some people, that can be addressed and can even enhance their practice. Nowadays, there are a lot of people that find it very difficult. They can even leave the church at a certain point because something, some tragedy happens in their life and that worldview no longer holds together. From a Buddhist perspective, uh, the, there might be problems for some people believing in karma, but it, you know, for instance, whatever we experience now, whether it be good or bad, is the result of our past actions. It's not no one else to blame fundamentally. You know, maybe we want to try to clean up society in such a way that we create the cooperative conditions that our negative karma and other people's negative karma doesn't ripen immediately. We don't want to have, you know, adverse conditions around us. But generally what happens to us, the fundamental cause is our own negative karma in the past. So this is a worldview that allows a, a Buddhist to be able to make sense of the world, you know, explain a, a lot of different things. Can ex and in a, to a certain extent, many people accept it on faith. Some people accept it intuitively, maybe because of imprints in past lives where they accepted this. There, there are many people that when, when reincarnation is introduced, they say, oh yeah, I believe that. Even, I believe in Christianity, even until the second co council in Constantinople of the church in the early days, I'm not sure when it was, 200 years after Christ or something, uh, at that point reincarnation was uh, banned as heretical. Up until that point, the implication meaning up until that point, there were a lot of people who integrated reincarnation into Christianity, or what the fledgling religion that we now call Christianity. The whole you know, the philosophical, theological questions, all the different branches of these churches have different interpretations. Also, uh, there's been some the Christian theologians that I've met that could even accept the possibility of reincarnation, you know, that the mind continues after this lifetime. The big, big difference between, let's say, Abrahamic religions and Buddhism, one, one of the big differences is that the mind was not created at the time of birth. That the mind has existed in the past numberless times. It didn't have a beginning, which is also problematic. So that's, you know, you could say karma is my problem or the mind reincarnation is my problem. God is your problem, karma is my problem. So you, you have you, one more question, then I'll just I'll try to finish up with something. Thank you so much. Yeah. Have you personally been able to determine any of your own past lives or karmic cycles? It's a mudra I learned in Italy. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like this. It's just the mother at the table, you know, the, the child's not eating, doing something naughty. It's just, no, I, I have no uh, experience like that. Sometimes we, we will do eventually some meditation, maybe in our retreat and even before. At the time of the Buddha, uh, <clears throat> the Buddha explained some methods to the monastics who were in the best position to uh, have success in meditation. Why? Because they were leading an ethical life devoid of, of uh, distractions. Uh, they put their attention into developing single-pointed concentration. And he explained how they could use that to develop the clairvoyance that recognizes past lives by 
for instance, by going over with a concentrated mind the events of today. Right now it's it's uh, twelve seventeen or something. Uh, I think at twelve, you know, ten minutes after twelve, we were taking a break. I went, you know, had a cup of tea, walked around. Before that, George was talking. Before that, uh, we were just entering the room. Before that, I was on the road. Before that, I was at the house having breakfast. I got up cranky or happy or whatever. I washed my and then jump to the first, go to the first thought of this morning, and then jump to the last thought last night before you went to sleep. Even though there's this big gap between this morning and last night. You might have woken up during the night, but let's say there was a night when you slept through. There's some period when the, the gross mind absorbed, but you can jump back to the last thought of last night and have confidence that that was you. Right? And go back to the events of yesterday as much as possible. At first time, maybe even to remember the events of today is difficult, but after time with a concentrated mind, it's almost like watching a movie in reverse. Go back all the way to the time of birth, of the time of being in the mother's womb. Even it's said that a person can remember even to the time of conception, vaguely, and then make the jump to the last thought, last life. Because of this perfect concentration, right now we, we, we can only imagine it. You know, we can, you know, we go back. As, as you do the meditation, you'll start to remember things when you were younger that you'd forgotten for years, just by the continuity of remembering year by year, month by month, whatever you can remember. So it's that kind of method that you can do. So when I've done that, I've sort of imagined but it's completely imagination, you know. You can you try it, you know. You can uh, you may come up. You were a turtle, or you were you were a, a yogi or yogini up in a cave in the Himalayas meditating. I don't know. Okay. So one of the things uh, that we, if, if you have a chance to read any of the literature before our next class, our next class will be a little bit longer. We'll have a break at. Uh, at about 12.30, and then we'll come back in the afternoon and continue, so it'll be a little more, a little more time. <clears throat> so if you have a chance to read some of the material that's suggested be between now and then, and as I said at the beginning, this is one of the uh, suggested readings, either in, of these editions that you can find. It's exactly the same book inside, just different titles. Uh, there's some other... What, what's, what are the other titles that are <coughs> suggested? Yeah. It, it, it's posted on the website. Um, okay. There's, on, on the website you can see the, the other titles, if you can get some of that. So what I want to read to you is some of these sections. Uh, they sometimes talk about the, the ten advantages or the eight, uh, the, the ten or eight disadvantages of not remembering, not being mindful of death, not thinking about death. You know, when you always say, that, okay, death, it's just, I don't want to think about it. You maybe you're, you know, you're telling me that it's something important uh, to recognize for these various reasons, but um, I'd rather not get into it, if you don't mind. What do they say in, in, the, in the West here? Uh, I, that's more than I need to know. <laughs> when, someone when someone starts telling about their personal problems, you know, that's more than I needed to know. Or something. TMI. Too much information. Too much information. Okay, I haven't heard that one. Okay. TMI. TMI, okay. Another, <laughs> another acronym to remember. Ah. In Singapore, they just where I was just at, there was just everything, whole sentence with one acronym at, after the other, you know, with a couple of verbs in between, and I couldn't understand. So thank you, TMI. <laughs> so you might think, uh, that's more than I wanted to know. There's too much information to know about death. But here, here's one, one way to think. The great beings that have evolved and become spiritually adept and become kind-hearted and transformed themselves have meditated, have become aware of the eventual death and meditated on it at the, during their life. And at the time of death, they die without any fear. Most of us in society today, in the West, say America, the West, that's a big problem. At the time, as people are getting older, there's this fear of death because they've never addressed 
that during your life. Because it's always been morbid to keep, keep it in the background. I mentioned the other night in the introductory lecture, a lecture on talk on meditation. Uh, sometimes you, someone will come to you, or you'll hear of someone that said they went to the doctor, and the doctor said you're going to die. I was like, excuse me, of course I'm going to die. I, from the time you were born, you were inevitably going to die. It's just like, how could it become a surprise that you're going to die? Of course, what they mean is that. They're going to die soon, sooner than they expected. But that's another thing that we address in the meditation on death. One of the great Tibetan yogis, Milarepa, who achieved enlightenment in one lifetime through the practice of uh, the esoteric practice of Buddhism called Tantra. He, when uh, some of his, they call spiritual songs, uh, he said that uh, when he was young, um, he had fear of death because he'd been very naughty when he was young. He'd, he'd, he'd developed, uh, when I say naughty, bad. He'd, he'd developed certain, certain psychic powers and sort of in retribution to some members of his family that had usurped his, his mother and, and his family's uh, wealth. He uh, used black magic upon them. A lot of people died. And then he came to recognize that negative karma, and he had a lot of fear of death. But he, went, he said, at, 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 when I was young, out of fear of death, I went to the mountains to meditate. He, he found his guru, Marpa, received instructions on Buddhism, went to the mountains to meditate. He said, after years of meditation now, when I die, I'll have no fear. Those that meditate on death during a lifetime, not only can you approach death with no fear, you can, Lamiesh used to say, it's, it's almost like going on a picnic. You know, at the time of death, instead of the fear of what's going to be coming, it's like, oh boy. Can you imagine that? Oh boy. <laughs> you know, having meditated on these, uh, not, not just the general fact that you're going to die, but the very process of death, which we'll touch upon, how to recognize it, to be aware of that as it's happening, and to use the subtle most mind at the time of death to meditate. Very, very powerful methods in Buddhism that are at our disposal. But they all depend upon becoming aware of death now. Rather than at the last minute when there's no time. You know, we're counseling our... our my, I'm, I'm of this, what's it called, generation, you know, that I was born in 1945. Baby, baby boomers. Baby boomers. Maybe there's some of you are baby boomers. Some of you are, there's other generations among you. Uh, you know, we're, we're getting, a lot of us are getting old and retiring and dying and getting, approaching death. And there's this fear. And there's counselors out there trying to counsel people about how to die and so forth. But it's very difficult at the last minute. It's like the, the mafia kingpin who, uh, you know, thinks he's Catholic. He thinks, at the time of death, I'll take confession. I'm just going to kill him till then. But it's very difficult if you haven't felt remorse during your life at the last minute <laughs> to really sincerely feel contrition or remorse for what you've done. Do you know what I mean? You have to be familiar during the lifetime. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to mention now uh, I, don't, I don't have a lot of any time, really, to go into detail, but um, what I'd like you to do is to read the sections on the disadvantages of not being mindful of death and the advantages of being mindful of death. Uh, if we are, you know, if you don't, let's just say in, in a nutshell, if you're not mindful of death, that is, if you don't take it to mind, if you're not aware of that, if you don't recognize that, you can spend your life in totally worldly, wasteful way that at the time of death you will totally regret. Just in a nutshell. There, there are ten kinds of reasonings that you can do. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit next time. We'll talk a little bit about more uh, what's called the nine, what are the main topics? Nine round meditation on death. An analytical meditation where we will investigate 
and try to recognize, get a taste of the inevitability, inevitability of death, the certainty of death. So it's not just, of course, if I ask any of you if you're going to die, is there anyone who doesn't think they're going to die? There's always some wiseacre or the monastery, they'll say, no, I'm not going to die. But we all intellectually know we're going to die. Those are kind of like, we're talking about other things intellectually. But do we, have we really realized that? If we really realized we were going to die, all, many of life's problems would not seem so important to us. Many of the things that we get heartache over and worry over would, you know, doesn't matter. You know, this too will change, you know. So if you can, if you can prepare uh, about these disadvantages and advantages, we'll talk a little bit about the nine round meditation on death, and also we'll, I'll begin to mention a little bit about the process of death that we can begin to get familiar with now death evolution. Okay, so let's end with a little, this, this is the right time, right? It's 1230? Yes. Yeah. Let's end with a little meditation in which we will try to dedicate the energy that we've created, the virtuous karma that we've created. So again, sit comfortably. Relax your body. Relax your mind. And by relax your mind, I mean remind yourself you don't have to think about all these thoughts. Just for a moment, be mindful of your breathing again. Don't be distracted by the hum of the lights, although that might be sometimes when it's quiet and you're not thinking of other things, your, your mind gets quite distracted to that. Simply hunker down, so to speak. Bring your attention inward and just watch the breathing. And as before, let go of your attention to the breathing and now place your attention on just your mental consciousness, looking inside. Watching your mind. Try to, through various means that we've talked about, try to get an intuition, a, a, a mental image of the spaciousness of the mind within which all the thoughts are popping up, the train of thoughts are chugging along. See between them, even when they're present, let go of them and sense the spaciousness of the mind within which they're arising. Something that may help is to imagine withdrawing your attention inward away from the senses like a turtle or tortoise pulling in its four legs and its head. Withdraw your attention away from the five senses down to the little area in the center of your chest like the heart chakra, very subtle mind. Hunker down in the cave of your mind.
that spaciousness of your mind that's always there, even if you only get a glimpse of it for a moment, sensing its presence, letting go of the thoughts, quiet, recognize that this morning we've created some imprints in our mind, virtuous karma, we would say, virtuous karmic instincts or imprints that will bring something pleasurable, a harvest of pleasant experiences in the future. Let's try to dedicate that merit, like you dedicate a certain amount of money that you've accumulated for a college education, you, you set it aside mentally or dedicate it toward your retirement. Dedicate these merits not for a simply future happiness, but they may become the cause of our spiritual development. To find real healing, real spiritual development from week by week, life by life, Due to these instincts I put on my mind today, may I begin to change, become a better person, overcome my faults, overcome my depression, low self-esteem, whatever. May I become eventually a Buddha, an enlightened being, taking the first steps right now for the welfare of others. May I become a beacon to the world, a, a real mensch. Due to these merits, may I become enlightened for the sake of all living beings. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.